water, the liquid that oceans are made of. And it fills endless depths. Only few will venture out into the endless open ocean of this vast underwater world. Most of the ocean inhabitants live in the city, as it were, like human societies. Very close together, with friendly neighbors and nasty co-tenants. While dangerous robbers lurk around at the edge of town. To assert yourself here, you have to be equipped with all kinds of tricks and clever strategies, or lie and cheat. Coral reefs are the largest structures in the world. They're giant submerged metropolises. Millions of different inhabitants live in these cities. A universe with coral palaces and soaring towers. Every neighborhood has a chief. The entire street belongs to this guy. No trespassing, okay? A typical large city with all the noise and ruckus. Even this little porcupine fish bleats around. It creates this sound with its swim bladder. Two small harlequin shrimps are nibbling on this blue sea star. If someone else shows up, he will catch hell. Another harlequin shrimp busy pulling a bite out of a sea star. More eels in disagreement. A scorpion fish shuffles across the ocean floor. Everything and everybody makes a lot of noise. A boxer crab threatens everybody that comes by, holding two poisonous anemones in its claws. At least the anemone reef looks peaceful, or does it? The clownfishes are having a huge squabble. Who does this anemone belong to? We can hardly see this fish, but he's easy to hear, a crocodile fish. Does this giant puffer fish hear something? It's a ray that's getting away. A dispute amongst the members of the cichlid family. Who is stronger, and especially who is louder? Two Walkman fish are noisily trying to woo a female. Big city noise everywhere especially when a large structure is being torn down. Everybody lives in their own way in this noisy metropolis. Some hover above it all, but others are more down to earth and literally live in the coral sand. These goat fishes, for example, they plow through the ocean floor and catch smaller animals between their teeth. They use their barbels like a dowser. With them, they can detect even the weakest electric fields that point them towards small prey. These gobies also dredge through the sand and feed on what they find in there. 
There's another way of finding prey in the sand. This blue-spotted stingray uses its wings like shovels, and there's always a chance of stealing something. While one works, others just stand by and feed on what's left over, maybe a piece of crab or a mussel. You have to be very familiar with this area to find the best morsels. This triggerfish uses a strong stream of water. The fish blows away the sand to unearth whatever is hidden inside it. Others are quick to steal whatever they can. The triggerfish is a commanding fish, and most reef inhabitants are easily intimidated by him, except for these strange visitors that don't seem to show fear. In any case, it's best to cover them up with sand. It's not easy for a small fish in a big city. There's always somebody with bad intentions. And you have to be extra careful not to get swallowed, like these moon wrasses, for example. So it's always safer for the smallest among the reef inhabitants to show up in schools. It's difficult to keep an eye out for only one little fish, and as a result, the predator often grabs blindly at nothing and comes up empty. To show up in a big mob is always safest. Others are easily distracted at the sight of so much prey all at once. This easy-going giant puffer fish would never have a chance here anyway. Being part of a school of fish is always the best protection from predators. The slow ones are being ignored. No danger here. The school distributes the danger. If there are a thousand fishes, any of them can be the target, and 999 are going to be just fine. But what about loners, or those that live as a couple? Seahorses, for example, camouflage themselves to look like the coral branches they're holding on to. Even more difficult to see, where is the animal here? Only the eye betrays this trumpet fish's camouflage. They do everything to not look like themselves, ornate ghost pipe fishes. They're inseparable, a couple. The female is already carrying eggs in her extended belly. Before long, the male will fertilize her eggs. They are still regular fishes, despite their unique costume. This one looks like torn off seagrass. The spiny wasp fish rocks back and forth in the current. Not a monster, but ingenious camouflage. A spider crab that's decorated its head with a sponge. This will deter any predator. Another great camouflage, a barrel decorated with rocks. Only the movement of the gills betrays this stonefish.
Even a smack with a fin doesn't bother him. The fish knows it will not hurt him. It only shoves him a little further to the side. Similarly tough are its cousins, the scorpion fishes. They lie there as if dead, especially when others around them freak out. And even when moray eels fight with lionfishes for food. The scorpion fish lies in wait for its chance. And then immediately becomes completely motionless again. The only difference is that it raises its dorsal fins with the poisonous barbs inside. It's completely still, but now also armed. This large anglerfish virtually blends into the background tangle of algae and leaves. Right now, the anglerfish is on high alert. It ejects a large cloud in order to throw off predators. It's not the time to feed or catch anything. Its angling rod is lying flat on the fish's back. The white tip at the end of the rod is used to lure prey. The anglerfish feels threatened by something. Finally, it gives up its camouflage and moves further over, using its fins to float. As soon as the fish retracts the fins, it sinks to the ocean floor. Anglerfishes come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Their trick is ingenious, using the angling rod as a lure. And every curious little fish becomes dinner. Many animals, including ocean inhabitants, communicate with a mixture of sounds and behavior. Everybody has to look out for their own survival in this metropolis of ocean inhabitants. But it seems maybe not quite everybody does it by themselves. The partner goby has come to an agreement with two pistol shrimps. The goby keeps an eye on things while the shrimps keep maintaining their hole. Larger rocks at the entrance are ideal for securing it. They're an experienced team. The shrimps keep in constant contact with the goby and even massage the fish's belly. The goby will get nervous without these gestures from the shrimps. The pistol shrimps need a cool and collected bouncer at their entrance. Teamwork. This is where the anemones settle with their poisonous tentacles. Whoever gets caught by those will pay for it dearly or lose their life. No wonder that there is virtually no one who likes to settle here. The little clown fishes are the only ones that know how to deal with these tentacles. They cover themselves with the slime of the anemone's tentacles and are protected from the poison. The clowns are safe in here and in return will protect their anemone as well as they can. This seems like a sensible deal. But on occasion, the anemone will pull the tentacles inside its column-shaped body, which means the clownfish's home is gone. When this happens, they panic and look for another anemone that they can hide in for the time being. Unfortunately, this one is already occupied, and the next one as well, and this means having to fight its current owner. There's much to lose for the clowns. Without the anemone, they can't procreate. The clownfishes attach their eggs to the bottom of the column-shaped foot of their anemone, hidden behind the poisonous tentacles.
Both male and female tend to the eggs. They fan fresh water on them. The eyes of the babies are already clearly visible. The clowns are very protective of their eggs. It takes the two of them to protect their offspring, and only in conjunction with the anemone. Everybody in the reef has to take special care of their young. If they don't, it means their species will simply die out. So it's not surprising that everybody gives it their best effort. This triggerfish has hidden its offspring in a small hollow in the sandy ocean floor. And this means having to constantly protect this open egg site. On occasion, they blow and fan the eggs, but mostly they keep an eye out for predators. This means grave danger. One of the sea urchins is wandering straight towards the nest. The eggs have to be protected at all cost, but how? The trigger fish seems to consider the alternatives. But then it blows and then rams the sea urchin. Again and again until it breaks, the sea urchin's guts spill out into the open. A few more hits for good measure. The danger has been averted. Everything else is easy. Two little damsel fishes cling to a coral branch, a pretty and obviously inseparable pair. They appear to have something important to do. And there it is. The female has been laying eggs and glued them to a coral branch. Over and over again, both of them sweep past the eggs to keep them clean. Two very busy parents in the middle of town. Not far from them, the same kind of damselfish, but this one is feeding on the eggs, not tending to them. This damselfish's priorities have changed. Its partner is gone, and it's impossible to bring the eggs through by itself. So it feeds on its own eggs to at least recycle the nutrients. There are many different strategies to give one's offspring a good start. Some are surprisingly easy. The mass mating of the black sea breams. The males are so generous with their sperm that often a cloud of it will engulf the entire wedding party. Countless couples and constantly in motion. A predator would have a hard time to find its bearings in this schooling behavior. The fish's instincts cause them to mass mate in order to ensure the survival of their species. Cardinal fishes have their own clever means of child protection. It's not time yet. The couple are still flirting and courting with each other, going around and around. We'll leave them to it and take a detour to a couple not quite as gentle with each other. Monkfishes live in groups and their nests are very close to one another. As a result, all the fishes are alerted to a predator nearing their nests. Hermit crabs love to feast on the eggs of the monkfishes, so the protective parents are all getting nervous.
the hermit crab is still far enough away and currently busy with something else. The hermit crab's best defense is its house that it carries around for protection. The patience of the monkfishes is wearing thin. Now everyone attacks in order to bowl the crab away from their nests. They're clearly telling this hermit crab to take a hike, but they should have stayed with their offspring because there's new danger approaching. A gaggle of rainbow wrasses takes advantage of this unique opportunity and ravages the monkfish nests. The predators are quick, brutal, and in the majority. Most of the monkfish eggs will be devoured. An attack of this kind would never happen to the cardinal fishes because they are mouth brooders and don't have to watch over a nest that's out in the open. The males carry the eggs in their mouths, up to 20,000 of them. A mobile nursery. They're safe here in their father's mouth, unless, of course, he gets eaten. During the night, when it's dark, the danger is greatest. These underwater cities have a very active nightlife with special attractions. Basket starfishes come out and sit in the current. It's a night active type of brittle star. With their arms full of tiny little hooks, they filter plankton out of the water to feed. A very elegant feather star. It's on the move to find a better spot to filter plankton. This Spanish dancer is even more graceful and elegant than the brittle stars. It's a type of nudibranch. The giant puffer fish is relaxed and spends the night dozing off on the sandy bottom. Others prefer the safety of their quiet bedroom, a surgeon fish. Everybody settles in for the night as comfortably as possible. The parrot fish tucks itself away in its mucus cocoon for protection against predators. Everybody's sleeping arrangements are different. The poor triggerfish has to stand guard by its nest all night long. There's no time to rest. Some of the predators are quite soft-footed. A cone snail has spotted a small fish. The snail is fast, and the prey disappears in the blink of an eye. The night is still young, and still full of danger and terror. These lionfishes pose danger to the cardinal fishes. Lionfishes suck in their prey. even if they choke on it. They're hanging around, waiting for their chance. This poor cardinal is sideways in the lionfish's mouth, eggs and all.
Lionfishes aren't the most elegant predators with all their attachments and frayed fins. But this is all part of their camouflage. They're harder to see and blend into the background. Outside the reef, the lionfishes hunt as a school. They drive their prey towards one another with their fanned out fins. They prefer to attack from above, cornering their prey. This is not a different location, just different light. These special blue lights totally change the appearance of the reef. Now we can see that the coral polyps are bright red and they clearly stand out from their environment. A new and fascinating perspective on the communication of many ocean inhabitants. And suddenly an eruption of sorts. looks like smoke, but in reality it's a type of reproduction. A carpet anemone is ejecting its sperm. In the blue light, it looks like a dramatic eruption. A hermit crab has a magic lantern. The blue light brings out these colors. An entire group of lionfishes on a food foray. The animals don't seem to know any fear. It seems that they're well aware of the poison they carry in their back spines. They even use the light of our dive torches to their advantage. There's no nightly rest to be had here. With the first daylight, new life comes into the reef city. seem to start going again, ponderously with armoured fins. As pedestrians, and as light and quiet as possible. Mother and daughter, elegant and synchronous. Some have to hustle along on ten legs. This spider crab runs straight into a brittle star gathering. A giant smash-up in the early morning. Wildly flopping around, everybody tries to get away. As in every city, there are also shopping opportunities here. This moray eel knows her shops well. She rushes to her favorite store every morning. The same with this blue-spotted ray. But they haven't opened yet. It leans on one fin as if to say, it's waiting. Similar problems in a branch further up. These sweet lips are also waiting to be tended to. Here they come, a little late this morning. The small, cleaner wrasses are starting to open their shop and are hungry. They're ready to rid their customers of parasites. This ray is also being served. 
It likes to have its gills cleaned. This is a barter business. One side gets cleaned, the other fed. A very fair deal. Clownfishes seem to be excluded from this business because they can't leave their anemone. In their case, the cleaner fishes make house calls. This snake eel is also otherwise engaged, and the cleaner shrimps are also making house calls for him. Finally, it's the moray's turn. It has a lot of nutritious freeloaders on its skin and in its gills. All of a sudden, the cleaners leave. Why? This Titan triggerfish is no better off. The treatment has stopped before he was finished. The cleaner fishes have new customers, clients that have never come to see them before, and they're now being preferred over old customers. The point is that these new clients will like the service here so much that they will come back again. The regular customers have to be patient and wait until the new clients are finished. Cleaner fishes operate solely according to economic rules. This guy has also come for the first time and quite enjoys their service. Sometimes it's too much of a good thing though. This small black spotted puffer just wants to look around and is not asking for a cleaning at this time. It swims away quickly and clearly annoyed. It's time to go back to the regular customers before they get impatient and leave for good. Digging deep where the gills are dirtiest. One last time through the mouth and it's as good as new and the teeth squeaky clean. Now this male moray can start looking for a suitable female. She is clearly not interested in male visitors. This next dugout also does not look encouraging. These two have already found each other. A strange pair with a triggerfish as roommate. They seem to get along just fine. It's difficult to cut in as a stranger. It would also be well advised to stay away from this giant triggerfish. This, on the other hand, might be a different situation. It's important to be patient. This female moray does not seem to be too reluctant. She's showing her teeth, which is not a sign of aggression, quite the opposite. She finally agrees to a date. The two of them are getting to know each other. Moray eels are very gentle with their mates. And they're good for another surprise, as partners of a phenomenal hunting party. These types of hunting parties have to find each other first in this big city. the right place for the moray and her partner. The morays cooperate with the groupers. It's not so far-fetched. The grouper hunts in the open and the moray inside the reef. The moray is able to get in between cracks and crevices that the grouper can't get to. Together, they're a strong team. 
A grouper that's trying to convince this moray to hunt with him. The grouper signals this to the moray by rocking back and forth and shaking for all it's worth. All for nothing. This moray doesn't understand and stays in its cave. Next try, maybe the moray will react this time and swim with him. Again, no luck. Finally, this moray seems to understand the grouper and is hungry. The grouper tilts its head and the moray accepts his invitation. Together they swim through the reef. The moray prefers to swim between the dark alleyways and the grouper decides it's safer to stay on the main streets around the reef. This is not the right place. The grouper expected to find scared prey here. The moray takes a break and waits. It's not going to happen this way. Again, another invitation to go. They continue through the reef to another coral head. Also nothing for them here either. The moray is getting ambitious as well now and initiates a hunt on her own. She might be better at finding hunting spots. They're successful in this next coral head and then everything happens very quickly. The fishes are panicked and both hunters are able to profit from that. This coral city offers living space for millions. Many hideouts and crevices provide protection for everybody. My home is my castle. While some escape between sharp corals, others curl up in a ball. Octopuses don't have bones and are therefore able to change shape. Their homes are usually very tight and space-saving. They like to live a bit further apart from their neighbors because they're not necessarily always friends with one another. It might be best to put up a wall of stones between them. The ocean offers many hideouts, which is synonymous with survival for many ocean inhabitants. There can also be hideouts that nature never intended to be there. Such as this giant wreck 240 feet deep. A research submarine on its way into the deep comes across a sunken freighter. It's an artificial world with countless nooks and crevices to offer protection and a home for many ocean inhabitants. The wreck has long been overgrown with all kinds of sea life. The side of the hull has become a living wall made of corals and sponges. Sunfishes, with their odd form of movement, patrol this area. They're looking for jellyfish. Steerage, where the current is strongest, filter feeders have found a new home, such as these sea fan corals. They feed on the tiny plankton particles, a unit that has grown together made of technical, man-made and organic structures. Even the steel anchor has grown a second skin made of living beings. It offers these delicate creatures a solid structure to grow on. 
they have all made a comfortable home in this sunken world. Not even the lights of the stub disturb any of the wreck inhabitants. New life has been created out of the tragedy of this sunken ship, the ingenious, life-renewing cycle of nature. The mores are sharing a home. They seem to be exceptionally friendly towards one another, even with this conger eel as their neighbor. Even the octopus remains unharmed by the mores. A unique environment made of steel that offers many different opportunities for ocean inhabitants to use it. Even this fishing net offers a conger eel a place to hide. The original destination of the sub is located a bit deeper, a picturesque underwater city full of ancient amphora architecture. An antique merchant vessel sank here. Only the clay containers, once filled with Greek wine, are still visible. Now they offer homes and protection to many ocean inhabitants. Similar to the reef, hiding places are essential for staying alive down here. The amphorae have a very special shape. They taper towards the bottom, so they could be stored sitting upright in a layer of sand in the hull of the ship. The amphorae and their precious contents were safe during transport. Spiny lobsters welcome these types of caves. Conga eels also feel safe in this mess of amphorae and shards of clay as if it was made for them and their slender, long bodies. The city of Amphory on the ocean floor provides countless opportunities to observe, disappear, and be unseen. Maybe that's why this city seems to be very calm and orderly, even when the conger eel swims above everybody's abode. Nobody panics because they only have to withdraw slowly into their homes and are safe. The same goes for this fork beard. The conger eel's only chance to make prey down here is to hide himself and ambush somebody. The sunfishes also don't have much luck feeding here, for the same reasons as the conger eel. On the other side of the globe, the Spencer Gulf in southern Australia. Every year, hundreds of giant cuttlefishes meet up to mate. The rocky seabed offers great holes and caves to hide the eggs. The females are smaller than the males and seem to be a bit shy, keeping their arms tucked tightly together. The males, on the other hand, present every bit of themselves openly to impress the females, but also other males that are potential rivals. When the going gets tough, it's always a good idea to hide behind the safety of a cloud of ink. Without much success, escape in reverse. Only the strongest of them have a chance with the females. He's a winner and courts his female by changing his color to interesting stripes. She has agreed to mate with him and they hug tightly. He deposits his sperm package into her mantle opening. 
Immediately afterwards, she withdraws into one of the caves on the ocean floor in order to avoid courtship from other males, a clear signal. The male is protecting his female from other rivals. But there's always the unexpected. A so-called sneaker male tries to cut in. This male is much smaller and pretends to be another female by acting like one, very demure and shy. All seems to be fine in the den. He's busy chasing away other rivals from this new supposed female. Especially now that there are two females under his protection. It can't hurt. The two supposed females on the bottom below him are getting closer to each other. The sneaker male and the female. They mate in secret under the protection of the strong male. As soon as the sneaker male is found out, it gets dangerous for him. But he has achieved what he came for and mated with this female. The beatings are nothing compared to the glory of his success. Intelligent strategies and tricks are essential for survival underwater and part of everyday life. A final dive into the magical world of sharks. This spot on a sandbank close to the Bahama Islands has great attraction for these lemon sharks. They come here by the hundreds, and nobody exactly knows why. This sandy plateau in the middle of the open ocean is easy for scientists to get to. This experiment will show how sharks react to their own reflection. The metal mirror stands upright on the seabed. The animals that swim towards it will see their own reflection coming closer. How will these lemon sharks react? Now the researchers have to have strong nerves. Things stay surprisingly calm. The foreign object is almost ignored, as if it had been there forever. The sharks either swim past it or underneath it. The scientists expected a bit more, and soon the sharks lose all interest in the mirror. Some sharks even calmly drop to the seabed to rest. The only ones alarmed by this behavior are the remoras that like to keep moving. They let go of their shark and see if they can't hitch a ride with a more active individual. shark hopping. This one isn't a good choice either, so they continue to yet another one. All of a sudden, something happens to the mirror, and the peaceful afternoon on the sandbank changes quickly into the complete opposite. The rope that the mirror is attached to loosens and the mirror falls over. Suddenly, and seemingly out of nowhere, several sharks rush to the mirror and show great interest in it. They smell and touch it, and they get more and more excited. What happened all of a sudden? 
None of the scientists have any idea how to explain this change in behavior. The animals that were calm and collected only a second ago are now completely out of their minds, and the situation quickly escalates into a mass attack on the mirror. Do they mistake their own reflection for an opponent? It's time for the divers to leave, because it's not safe anymore. The communication of the ocean inhabitants continues to offer new and exciting insights that we will probably never fully understand them. Where the Indian Ocean collides with the southern cliffs of Africa, Cape fur seals bring defenseless young into the world. A challenging world where a pup's journey to adulthood is under constant threat. A dangerous voyage of a seal led astray by one of nature's most mysterious migrations. Followed by hundreds of hunters, hungry for one of the ocean's most awesome events. The Feast of Predators. Winter on the untamed shores of the wild coast. Here, the calm ocean surface conceals the turmoil stirring in the currents below. Millions upon millions of tiny fish swimming for their lives. A formidable migration called the sardine run. A 10-year-old bull seal plunders the shoals. But he's not alone. He is a rogue in the midst of an army of predators. This is their annual feast. A feeding frenzy of immense proportions. The attack is relentless. And now, the sharks join in. Birds plunder from the air. Eventually, the feast comes to an end. For the bull seal, this was a royal banquet. He watches the rest of the sardines swim away. It's now the end of winter, and the shoals disappear into the ocean depths. Their destination? one of the most puzzling unsolved mysteries of nature. With nothing left to hunt, the predators leave the wild coast. The bull is a thousand kilometers from home, and so are the gannets. They begin their return trip to their summer breeding colonies in the Cape, not many seals ever embark on such a long journey. His return home will be a three-month-long test of endurance. The predators follow Africa's southern shoreline from the subtropical wild coast all the way to the continent's most southern extremity, 
the Cape. Here, the coast is cooled by the currents and warmed by the African sun, an ideal habitat for birds and mammals that breed on land and feed on the bounty of the sea. The bull's home colony occupies a rocky island off the southern tip of Africa. 500 meters from its shores, he enters the kelp forest. It's November, the beginning of summer, and he joins other bulls returning to mate. But to reach land, they must run a dangerous gauntlet. The half kilometer wide corridor between kelp forest and the island harbors the most lethal of seal hunters, the great white shark, a calculating predator who's perfected the skills of surprise, ambush, and attack. To get past the enemy, the seals gather in groups and make a sprint for land. The combination of speed and porpoising maneuvers should confuse the attacker. Every run of the gauntlet could be a seal's last swim. Survival depends on the luck of the draw. This time, the big bull escapes the jaws of death and reaches the shallows. He's safely home. Now, he needs to stake out a territory. He has the advantage of being the largest bull around, and in a seal colony, size certainly matters. No one dares get in his way. Confidently, he returns to the same territory he held the year before. Twenty-five square meters occupied by 15 consorts. It's a tight and uncomfortable squeeze and the bull needs to enforce the peace. He also won't allow any other males to invade his turf. Within a week, territories are defined and the pregnant females prepare to give birth. One of the bull's concubines goes into labor. The contractions come quickly. She's in pain and the father of her pup takes no notice. She suffers through almost an hour of labor. The bull has no interest in her yet. His only concerns are the females in estrus. his mother's attention.
seven kilograms and larger than most newborns. The perfect recipe for a seal that might attempt a journey such as the sardine run. But for the moment, his world centers on his mother. Their individual call, smell, and touch develop the imprinting that will bond them for the next nine months. While mom rests, he finds his source of milk and figures out how it all works. Now that he's dealt with the priorities of a newborn, he can take a good look around. He's not the only newborn on the island. Within a month, all the pregnant females of the colony give birth to ensure that they will all mate again before the bulls leave. The scavengers keep the island clean. The beginning of summer is a busy time of year on the Cape's rocky islands. It's the seabirds' breeding season, too. They pair off, mate, and tend to their eggs. At the Gannet colony, mornings are particularly frantic. One of each of the chick's parents fights through a barrage of beaks to get to the runway. Their fast-growing hatchlings demand a fresh catch every day. Gull parents have it easier. They pick up whatever the tide washes onto the beach, although they're not too keen on sharing. Cormorants prefer to nest higher up on the rocks. The catch of the day is liquidized and regurgitated on demand. It's a young bird's treat. While the birds feed daily throughout their breeding season, the bulls and mothers go without food through theirs. Oblivious to his mother's fasting, the young pup is quite a handful. He has an adventurous nature. But his mother doesn't let him go far. He protests. A week into the pup's life and his father ambles towards him for the first time. 300 kilograms of pure strength, an icon for the pup to aspire to. But the bull doesn't even cast the pup a glance. His attention is focused on the pup's mother, now ripe for mating. Driven by instinct, she follows the bull and leaves her pup on his own. So small and vulnerable, yet already abandoned. But she must make the most of the bull's attention and mate before he leaves the island. This is probably the last time the pup will ever see him. The life of a newborn seal is no easy ride. By the end of December, the bull has fulfilled his only paternal duty, impregnating the females with his strong genes. For the next year, he will roam the ocean south of Africa, and perhaps he will follow the sardine run once more. Most of the adult females of the colony are now pregnant and need to feed. After two weeks of fasting, their fat reserves are depleted. 
and the pup's only source of nourishment, his mother's milk, is running low. Following her is not an option. And if she doesn't return within the next five days, he will die of starvation. Abandoned first by his father and now by his mother, life is not looking good for the pup. His mother joins other females on an expedition to find food. But before they can hunt, they must run the gauntlet. Once again, the cunning stealth of the great white shark is measured against the lightning reflexes of the seals. This time, the seals win. They spot the shark before it can make a move. Now the mother and her allies can look for food. They swim towards the mainland. 15 kilometers from the island, she finds a pocket of sardines trapped in the shallows. With agile moves, she picks them out one by one. On average, she would eat about four kilograms of these tiny fish, but this time, she needs to stock up her reserves and produce enough milk to stay on land with her pup for at least a week. This small school of sardines is just enough for a filling meal. Sardines thrive in these cool waters. Their habitat spreads over a 400 square kilometer underwater plateau that stretches south from Africa's shores. The ocean here is crammed with their favorite food, microscopic plankton, making conditions so perfect that these waters support billions of sardines, some of the largest breeding stocks in the world. And the secret to their success? Flood the waters with an oversupply of eggs, a vast majority of which do not hatch. But those that do develop quickly, and within four days, they hatch into larvae. They're plankton size now, bottom of the food chain, and even eaten by their own kind. Over four months, they transform into fish-shaped juveniles that can swim and shoal. Four centimeter long fingerlings, no better off in the food chain than when they hatched. And even when they reach adult size, they'll still be pursued by larger predators. But to catch a sardine, the predator has to be as agile as the fish. Mammals that hunt in water require custom-built features to capture their prey. Seals can remain underwater for over 10 minutes by slowing their heart rate and storing oxygen in their blood rather than in their lungs. Their nostrils are naturally closed when relaxed and compressed even tighter by the water pressure. While catching food, no water is swallowed either because throat muscles close the gullet. While the seal mother gorges on the sardines and rebuilds her fat reserves, back at the colony on Seal Island, her adventurous young pup has found a playmate. The two make a mischievous pair innocent of the fact that the gull has a lethal beak that could inflict a serious injury. The bird is quickly forgotten and the two playmates romp and fight, already training for adulthood. 
By midday, most adults laze in the sun, or sky point, a comfortable pose for a seal. And if adults do it, Lying down seems a much easier option. Two days alone, and the pup has played with his newfound friend and explored his surroundings. It doesn't seem too bad without mom. By the third day, he starts to get hungry and explores the shore in search of something to eat. But kelp is no mother's milk. Maybe being home alone is actually not that much fun. So many females. Surely one of them could be mom. But not one of them smells right. And now he's desperately hungry. His calls for mom go unheard. Then he finds a source of milk from a female suckling her pup. And he tries to sneak in for a drink. But he's caught out. Mothers don't tolerate strange pups. This adventure is becoming dangerous. Then he wanders too close to another hostile mother. survive till his mother's return? More importantly, will his mother return? The fifth day starts with all the promises of summer and the safe return of the mother to Seal Island. But she has no way of knowing if her pup has survived. The shore looks like a killing field. She calls and waits for a reply. cry. Mom is home and her young pup passed his first survival challenge. Now he doesn't let her out of his sight. Each mouthful of rich milk, he builds his strength. But a healthy body is not enough to survive to adulthood. He will need to become shrewd and agile to keep out of trouble and find his own food, all talents that he still has to develop.
then, six weeks into his existence, one of these life skills is put to the test. For his first swimming lesson, his mother chooses a particularly rough surf day. He can barely keep his head above water. But mom helps keep him afloat. It's a tough lesson to learn, but vital for his progress. Eventually, he begins to get the hang of it. A last wave to help him ashore, and the lesson is over. From here on, he needs to perfect these skills, and then perhaps take on a bull's most grueling test, the thousand kilometer journey of the sardine run. Only time will reveal his true colors. Seasons pass over the islands. Birds migrate for the winters and return here to roost in the summers. Each year, the bulls return to the colony to mate. And the mothers break their bonds with old pups and develop new ones with their newborns. Three years of changing Cape weather and dangerous seas have challenged the inhabitants of Seal Island. But through it all, the pup has grown into a strong and confident young seal. He dominates over his peers, showing all the signs of having inherited his father's supreme genes. And after asserting his superiority, it's time for a workout in the sea. These games quicken his reflexes and improve his speed and agility. Moves that will prove vital in avoiding the jaws of a great white. All skills needed for a fine-tuned hunting ability. Today's exercises take him past the Gannet colony. It's February and the fledglings are learning to fly. But perfecting the laws of aviation is no easy feat. The floundering Gannets attract the young seal's attention. At this age, he's up for any game. into a calculated killing. He only eats the soft belly and leaves the rest to the scavengers of the sea. Such a cruel act, and the young seal proves to be a serious contender in the passage to adulthood. Now he is ready to leave the colony for his life's adventures. But first, he must pass one more test, probably the most dangerous yet. Sneak past the great white sharks the ever-present menaces that patrol the channel next to the island. Patient, vigilant, 
and always hungry. The autumn winds blow in from the cold south. They alter the flow of the surface currents. And suddenly, the sharks turn their attention away from the seal colony. Their acute smell picks up a new scent coming from the open ocean, an irresistible odor to a shark. rotting mammal meat, the carcass of a southern right whale. 60 tons of floating meat and blubber, enough to feed all the great whites in the area. When an easy meal like this comes along, they're first at the banquet. Despite the great whites' extraordinary hunting ability, second only to the killer whale, they are not above scavenging. They all share the carving up of the whale. This will keep them busy for at least four days. For now, the siege of Seal Island is on pause. And seeing their chance to sneak past unnoticed, the young male and his peers make a dash for the open sea. Their escape coincides with the onset of winter, which brings one of the biggest changes of the year to the Cape of Storms. From the south, powerful weather fronts pound the land and rearrange the currents. A stream of cold water carrying a fresh supply of nutrients is pushed to the surface and up South Africa's eastern coast. Now the sardine's ideal habitat expands from Africa's southern tip, a thousand kilometers northeast, past the cliffs of the wild coast and all the way to Durban's subtropical shores. This is the winter countercurrent that lures two-year-old sardines to begin one of nature's most impressive marathons, a mass migration of millions upon millions of fish. But in their quest to reach these alluring feeding grounds, they leave behind a trail of body fluids, an invisible oil slick with a powerful smell. appetizing aroma for those who find the sardines a trophy worth pursuing. Common dolphins, 
and copper sharks pick up the slimy trail and leave the Cape waters to chase the sardines on their epic journey. The three-year-old seal smells this promise of a feast. But this journey into unknown waters might be beyond his means. And 500 kilometers from home, the seals attract the attention of a master killer, and it's not interested in the sardines. seal gets away with a minor scrape and takes refuge with his peers on the reef below. Another triumph over one of life's challenging tests. Now he keeps a low profile, but the longer he waits here, the greater the distance between him and the traveling sardines. Even gannets that left the Cape to follow the same silver shoals now overtake the seal. The cold current from the south guides the sardines further up South Africa's east coast. And 800 kilometers from their home waters, the underwater continental shelf narrows to six kilometers from the shores of the wild coast. This forces the cold current from the south closer to land. The sardines have no choice but to squeeze tighter together. Now the million strong schools form well-defined shoals and clear targets for the predators. This is where the sardines enter hostile territory. To keep alive, they must outrun their hunters. Common dolphins unite into a superpod. Thousands of them now move in formation, swimming as fast as 37 kilometers per hour. They scan the ocean with their powerful sonar. It's only a matter of time before they locate the sardines. Immediately, the little fish employ their best defense tactic form an enormous mass that constantly changes shape, size, and direction, designed to confuse and elude the attackers. But the dolphins are too smart for that. They separate a section of the huge shoal and round them up into a swirling mass called a bait ball. The dolphins let the rest of the mother load swim away. The small bait ball is now of a manageable size and easy to attack. By the time the dolphins have prepared the banquet, the copper sharks arrive to share the feast. It is believed that the sharks find the bait ball by listening to the dolphins' clicks and whistles. Disregarding their mammal counterparts, they plunge in immediately. Eventually, the relentless attackers drive the bait ball against the surface of the sea. Dolphins and sharks trap the sardines from below. 
and gannets attack from above. These birds can dive five meters deep, enough to make a calculated snatch of one sardine. as an organized dolphin operation turns into a confused feeding frenzy. This bait ball is doomed to extinction. Eventually, all that is left is a gang of predators hungry for more. That was just enough to arouse their hunter lust. They resume their pursuit of the mother load of sardines. The dolphins take the lead. hundred kilometers behind them, the three-year-old missed the entire bait ball event while avoiding the great white's jaws. But he survived and is on the move again. If he swims fast enough, he'll catch up with the action. As winter intensifies, more storms blow in from the south. An inconvenience for the seals, they're not fond of heavy seas. But the seals' nightmare is the sardine's blessing. The weather fronts replenish the cool, nutrient-rich current, the fuel that drives the billion-strong migration further up the coast. Now the sardines must tighten their ranks some more as the countercurrent squeezes into an even thinner strip. Here, the tiny fish are forced through a crush bordered on one side by the cliffs that mark the northern boundary of the wild coast, and on the other side by the warm south-flowing Agullus current, too warm for the sardines to bear. This current brings new players into the fray. Bottlenose dolphins are larger and slower moving than their common cousins, but just as artful. Now the enormous schools of sardines are tracked down by two different sets of sonar. More heavies join the ranks of hunters, dusky sharks. The waters are getting crowded. Ten kilometers behind the gathering predators, the young seal and his peers are back on the trail of the sardines. He's now almost a thousand kilometers from home, but the excitement of the chase spurs him on. To pinpoint the action, he looks out for circling gannets. From the air, the bait ball organized by the dolphins is unmistakable. sardines trapped behind invisible sonic walls emitted by the circling dolphins. Common and bottlenose dolphins work together. They alternate between patrolling the outer rim and plundering the loot. sharks coming to feed. The smaller copper sharks dart quickly in and out of the bait ball.
the larger and heavier dusky sharks make more calculated attacks and take larger mouthfuls. seal, like his father, a pirate among the raiders. But while he's in the thick of it all, he cannot see the other predators approaching from the outside. And a three-meter dusky shark could easily snap him up for food. Now, more than ever, the young seal is playing with his life. Inevitably, the manic feeding rage produces a casualty. Predators continue their relentless attack. This is a spectacular underwater assembly of predators united to decimate the ranks of the enormous bait ball. A brigade of a thousand dolphins, the masterminds behind it all. A battalion of over 200 sharks that take advantage of the dolphins' clever work. Mobbed from the air by hundreds of gannets. In between, tuners enjoy the rich pickings. And among the throng, a few brave seals, richly rewarded for their tenacity. For the hunters, there is no better feast, a unique feast that only occurs once a year, here in the waters of the wild coast. Five hours later, and the huge bait ball is reduced to a fraction of its original size. The dolphins give up their sonic siege, allowing the surviving sardines to escape. These join up with the tail end of the mother load that made it through the treacherous gauntlet of the wild coast, and they all dive into the depths offshore. It's now the beginning of summer, and the surface of the water, warmed by the African sun, becomes an unbearable bath for the sardines. From here, their movements puzzle scientists despite attempts to follow their course. The sardines are so small and the ocean is so vast that they are incredibly difficult to follow. The general consensus is that these fish stay in the depths off Durban and around November, they begin to migrate back towards the Cape. But this is all speculation, and their homebound voyage remains a mystery. And what of the three-year-old seal? Has he too gone astray into the immensity of the ocean? During his short life, he completed a dangerous mission, but now he needs to accomplish a more important voyage, the one to adulthood.
For the next seven years, he will be a nomad, growing in size and strength, so that one day he can return to the colony as a full-sized bull. Only then will he be ready to start a lineage of his own. And in this world, breeding is the supreme purpose of nature. A plain yet effective concept when used in the context of tiny fish such as sardines. Too simple to outsmart their hunters, but so fertile that they outbreed them. And this is only one of their many mysterious secrets of survival in an ocean dominated by predators.